I'm Julie Zenner, and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Superior Mayor Jim Payne is here with his reaction to the Wisconsin Supreme Court striking down the state's safer at home order. Meanwhile, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz announced the latest phase in the reopening of Gopher State businesses. We'll hear from school superintendents from northern Minnesota about distance learning and graduation planning, and the latest on Italy's reopening from a coronavirus lockdown. It's all coming your way next on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching. Dennis is off this week as we alternate hosting the program during the pandemic. This week's show was recorded on Thursday afternoon and includes pre-recorded interviews. Late Wednesday, the Wisconsin Supreme Court ruled the Evers administration's safer at home order invalid. The four to three decision by the court allows bars and other businesses in the state to reopen immediately. Governor Evers says the ruling has thrown the state into chaos. Joining us now with his reaction is Jim Payne, the mayor of the city of Superior. And welcome back, Mayor Payne. Appreciate you coming in on what has to be a very hectic day for you. <laughs> yes, it's been uh, stressful and frustrating today. <laughs> Governor Evers described the situation in Wisconsin as similar to the Wild West. Is that what uh, you saw immediately in Superior when things, st when words started getting out? Uh, there was certainly a lot of confusion uh, when that order came out. And uh, while the actual ruling was not terribly unexpected, the way in which it happened uh, really created quite a bit of confusion and even chaos. I, we, we expected a stay to the order when it was released. And I mean, it would have been more convenient to even have it come out during business hours so we could work on understanding it and providing answers a little bit more quickly than we were able to. Mm -hmm. Now, as we mentioned in the open, this was recorded on Thursday and you did spend the day kind of, you know, putting heads together, trying to figure out what the plan is going forward locally with Superior and Douglas County. What was worked out? What does the situation look like? Uh, so the Douglas County Health Officer still has a lot of wide latitude. Uh, in fact, the Supreme Court did not take away the powers of local health officials to do what Secretary Andrea Palm had done. They only took away her power to do that. So a number of communities across Wisconsin we're making similar decisions uh, today. What we're doing in northern Wisconsin is implementing the guidelines of the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation to reopen all businesses safely. And we are going to apply those, those guidelines to every single business, not just non-essential businesses. If you are going to open in the city of Superior or Douglas County, you must comply with these guidelines. Mm -hmm. And what do those guidelines look like? Can you give some examples of the, the types of requirements that businesses will face? Uh, they will uh, have uh, much more stringent hygiene and cleanliness standards. They do have some social distancing requirements built into them. Uh, they do not contain specific numbers of people allowed in any one business, uh, but it gives very clear parameters on what every specific business does, whether you are a restaurant or a tavern or Walmart. It's, it's going to say exactly what you need to do. Uh, and so some of them are outright requirements, like you cannot allow an employee that's running a fever to come into work. Uh, many more are recommendations, uh, like how many people should be allowed uh, in a given space or how far apart they should be and how you can affect that. Mm -hmm. Well, everyone knows that Superior has a lot of bars. It's well known for, for its hospitality. Um, are bars, restaurants, and other businesses like that, have they been in contact with you today? Or are, you, are you trying to work through some of these issues with them directly too? Yeah, ever since the order came out, a number of uh, tavern and restaurant operators have had a number of questions. They've been reaching out directly. Personally, I've been very encouraged that the vast majority of all of these owners have tried to understand the order and ask questions before they rush to open. They really want to respond safely to this order and to protect their employees and customers. So that's why we were working hard to give them clear answers as quickly as possible. I know everybody wanted to know the answers last night, but the fact is we want to make sure that what we're telling them is true and responsible so that they can put in a safe and responsible plan as quickly as possible so that they can uh, get back to business in a way that protects them, 
uh, protects their employees, protects their customers, and allows them to uh, support their livelihoods. Mm -hmm. Now the number of COVID-19 cases in Superior Douglas County has been um, smaller than some other parts of the state. In some ways, is it nice as a, a local official to be able to kind of customize what's going on um, here on the, the front lines? Um, I, I wouldn't say it's nice to be able to do that. The nice thing about uh, a statewide order, particularly when you are flanked by other states with statewide orders, uh, protecting the public from spreading this virus too aggressively is we don't have as much risk of somebody coming here with the virus. The, these restrictions were taking place statewide in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan. So it was just, uh, when we have a regional approach, we, can no, we can't control what people are doing in other communities. And so if there's an outbreak in a different county in Wisconsin or in a different place in Minnesota or Michigan, and it comes to Douglas County, it's, it's much harder to control. So while yes, it is nice to be able to respond to our specific situation, we can't close the borders, we can't stop people really from coming here, and the virus doesn't respect county borders. Mm -hmm. What about testing? Um, are there opportunities that, for testing to ramp up in this area so that people can find out a little more uh, fully what the virus is, is looking like here? Yeah, testing is the way out of this crisis. Uh -huh. Every public health expert agrees on that. Uh, and we do have a number of testing, and the number of tests are increasing seen almost daily. Uh, right now, our public health department is able to pretty much test whoever they want to test, which is very good because it allows them to track the spread of the virus and to contain it. But on the other side, uh, we are also starting to see more antibody testing in the Twin Ports, and that gives public health officials a better picture of how far the virus has gone. We may only have a dozen positive cases right now, but early on there really wasn't much testing available, so we don't know how far this virus really made it before we got a good picture of it. Mm -hmm. And antib antibody testing helps determine that. So it, it testing tells us where we are. Mm -hmm. We have about 10 seconds, uh, but any, any thoughts looking toward the summer if there's an end in sight? There is an end in sight. We have a lot of great news that we're looking at and this crisis will end and we are finally starting to see the metrics that will show us an end to this crisis. We're not there yet, but we are getting there. All right, Mayor Jim Payne of Superior, thank you so much for coming in. We really appreciate it. Of course, thank you. All right, thank you. In Minnesota, the state is slowly beginning a phased reopening. On Wednesday, Governor Tim Waltz announced the latest turning of the dial to allow some businesses to reopen on May 18th, following some strict guidelines. Here's more from the governor's announcement. We know there's no stopping the storm of COVID-19 from hitting Minnesota, but we've prepared for it. We've successfully pushed out and reduced the peak of this virus. We've made great progress to ensure we can treat Minnesotans who fall ill. Thank you for your sacrifices. You've saved the lives of thousands of Minnesotans. At this point in time, Minnesota is staying steady in hospitalizations. With the capacity that we've built while you stayed home, we can chart a new way forward. We believe that we should be able to handle an increase in cases as more people move out and about. We can use what we've learned about the virus and how it spreads to inform our next steps. We can take a measured Minnesota approach that protects public health and improves economic stability. This means a cautious strategic steps forward, and it means clear measures for determining if and when we need to pull back. We're not flipping a switch and everything's going back to normal at once. We're slowly moving the dial and introducing more interaction between people over time. As we consider what can safely resume or reopen, we must take into account three critical factors. First, how close are you another person in a given setting or activity? Second, how long are you in that close proximity to another person? Third, how predictable that setting is. For an example, you're walking past people in a hardware store wearing a mask, that's less risky and more predictable than setting for a meal in a crowded restaurant. That's the lens we're using when we consider how we can safely turn the dial. And starting on May 18th, we're turning the workplace dial. Non-critical businesses like retail stores and Main Street businesses can reopen if they have a safety plan and can operate at no more than 50% capacity. Small businesses are critical to the social and economic fabrics of our communities all across Minnesota. I recognize how hard this pandemic has fallen on them, and I hope this action charts a safe and prosperous path forward. We can make this turn of the dial and keep people safe if we can trust each other to continue to be cautious. We need business owners to follow the new guidance to protect workers and customers, and we encourage customers to wear masks, 
socially distance, and don't congregate for long periods of time in stores. As we look forward, I've directed my cabinet to continue the extensive discussions they're already having with health experts and thousands of businesses on future openings. I'm directing them to assemble similar guidance on how to safely reopen bars, restaurants, barbershops, and salons beginning on June 1st. This will coincide with a significant increase in testing, tracing, and isolating the virus in the state. We're also turning the social dial. I know this has been incredibly hard. Weddings, funerals, graduations have been postponed. The letters I've received from young children offering to cancel their birthday parties for others breaks my heart. Our social and mental well-being is an important factor as we chart our path forward. When the stay-at-home order ends on May 18th, we're replacing it with a new order that brings back more of the social interactions that are so important in life, but still ask Minnesotans to stay safe. Stay Safe Minnesota will still ask people, stay close to home, limit travel to what's essential, but we can now gather with friends and family of groups of less than 10. This CDC guidance in all cases is asking Minnesotans not to gather in large groups. All gatherings, whether a backyard barbecue or a religious meeting at a church, synagogue, or mosque are limited to 10 and require that social distancing. Don't get me wrong. We believe that the safest place we can be is at home, but we know we can't continue like this forever. So we're making turns on both the business and social dials in order to slowly and safely reopen our society. This situation's fluid. There's much we still don't know about this virus. And as I said previously, we must be prepared to dial back if needed. Schools in the region are busy wrapping up distance learning and preparing for graduation under the pandemic. This week, a number of school superintendents in northern Minnesota joined a Zoom call to talk about the challenges they faced this spring. Here are some excerpts of that discussion. Obviously, graduation has been the ta hot topic. I sat in on the school board association meeting yesterday where the, the commissioner was on there, and uh, that's probably one of the most passionate things that are happening in our state right now as schools talk about graduation. Schools like mine that are small um, or people that are speaking for schools like mine that are small have a tendency to feel like, you know, we could manage all these uh, DNR and um, um, uh, MDH and MDE guidelines very easy by having them in our buildings. But uh, the commissioners made it very clear that COVID uh, doesn't know what size your school is. So in regards to graduation, uh, pretty much in both of my districts, we are gonna take the graduation uh, to the kids. So what we tried to do is rather than focus on what we can't do, we wanted to focus on what we could do as a small school and an advantage to be in a small school. So like Ray, my graduation in both of my buildings is about 20. Uh, Northland will be graduating on the 28th and the 29th and Hill City will be graduating on the 29th. And basically, if you were standing on the stage for a traditional graduation, we're putting you in the bus and we are going to the student's house and we're just going to get out of the bus and put on a five minute ceremony. Um, this, uh, the students can who have whoever they want at their house as we uh, as we do a little mini ceremony. Um, we've got law enforcement going to uh, coming in. We got fire engines going to be following us in. So as an example in Grand Rapids, I live in Grand Rapids and I have a student who lives right down the block from me from Hill City and I'm thinking how cool it would be when a couple of fire, a fire truck and a couple of uh, police uh, with uh, sirens blaring pull into the front of the house and, and do a, a mini ceremony for that student, let them celebrate that with their family and then go on to our next students. In both Nashua, Kiwan and in Deer River, we'll be holding a graduation that has kind of a drive-in movie theater uh, approach. Um, we had other plans set up until last Friday when those new guidelines uh, changed those plans for us in Nashua, Kiwan, and that graduation will occur on uh, May 29th and in Deer River it will occur on May 31st. We've also made some adjustments to grading policies in both districts and really around the state to reflect the need to continue the learning as well as to uh, accommodate students that are struggling with this different learning environment. And so 
showing them some grace and trying to protect them into the future uh, and making sure that their transcripts as they move to higher education, if they do that, uh, that those that they remain protected and they can um, that their future remains uh, uh, in sight. And uh, we're looking towards the future. We have a limited guidance on what we're able to do this summer. Uh, right now, there are only a couple instances where students are allowed in the school. Most of the schools in our region have had summer school programs, but uh, we're at this point not able to operate those in the same way. So we're waiting for more guidance on that and then looking to the fall planning for uh, many different possibilities as, as far as what fall could look like. and. Um, our assumption is that we won't know what we're going to be able to do this fall until much, much closer to this fall. Here in Floodwood, we have typically been serving between 200 and 240 breakfast and lunches that we deliver to homes every day. Um, and thankfully, we have an amazing staff here at Floodwood that has just jumped on board and have been very supportive of our families and one another. Um, our um, graduation will be held on May 29th and it will be a virtual graduation. Um, although we do have it set up where the graduate and their parents will come into the building um, to walk across the stage um, we're going to record them and put it together in, in a ceremony. Um, we have 22 graduates at Floodwood, and so I feel like we're able to honor the guidance that's put forth through um, the Department of Health and MDE, but still celebrate our seniors. Uh, recently, we received updated information on graduation from the Departments of Health and Education. As a school district for both the Big Fork graduating class and the Grand Rapids graduating class, we believe we've created ceremonies that will celebrate the amazing achievements of these graduates, while still keeping those children, their families, and the community safe. Graduates and their immediate families will be invited to participate in ceremonies in front of our schools, while the community will be available or able to view the ceremonies live on Facebook. We're also working hard to make sure that your kids and our kids will be safe and ready to return when school starts again in the fall. We continue to receive guidance and updates from the Department of Health and the Department of Education. And as we receive those updates, we monitor and adjust the plans that we are putting into place. Our teaching staff and our support staff have go gone above and beyond to assist in the educational delivery of distance learning in these last period. Um, our staff have utilized our one-on-one -on -one devices with our students. Um, the district has purchased several hotspots to assist in some of those students that didn't have direct connection um, with these families to at least um, provide the best educational that we can in this time frame. Um, in addition, you know, we've been providing childcare um, for the tier one families that has ranged anywhere from 10 to 25 students per day. Our food service, um, we've been providing meals of anywhere from 400 to 1,000, depending upon which day and the amount of delivery that we are doing. Uh, we did a survey as well and asked our parents what was challenging the most to them. And in both cases, in both communities, the two things that parents struggled with the most were balancing their own personal lives and their work, and in some cases, their own going back to school with being their child's teacher. And the second thing in both communities was motivating their their child or their student. And so again, like Mr. Martinson said, we made some adjustments to that, tried to increase the amount of engagement and connections that we were making at home. And um, I think that all in all, it's been going well. We've definitely had some challenges, but have been working through those. Hey, there are some things that I think we're gonna keep uh, in the tool belt come fall, even if we came back full force and didn't have to do any distance learning. Uh, the way we use technology, the way we do our uh, IEP meetings, uh, even in some aspects, the way we meet as a staff and how using this format, how, how easy it is. Um, the other piece I think that's been really positive is the interactions with parents. I've been doing this 32 years and, I, and I've never sat in meetings and had teachers talk uh, 
ad nauseum on how they're trying to get a hold of a parent or a kid, or they met with this uh, parent, or yeah, they're very sensitive to that parent because there are six kids in the house. And even uh, the teachers that have gone out on these routes, these meal routes, and have seen um, the neighborhoods of the kids they've been teaching for maybe 20 years and never been out there. So that's been really a positive thing. Finally this week, some good news coming out of Italy on the coronavirus pandemic. Lieutenant Commander Roger Reinert is deployed with the U.S. Navy's Crisis Action Team in Naples, Italy. He joins us now via Zoom with the latest on the situation there. And welcome, Roger. Thanks for staying up late with us. I understand it's getting close to midnight there. Yeah, no problem. Uh, good to see and hear you, Julie. Yeah. I, now, Italy, of course, was one of the hardest hit countries in the world and actually went into near total national lockdown uh, back in February. But now restrictions are being lifted. Tell us about what's happening there. Right. Yeah. So as you said, uh, beginning in February, Italy went into a national lockdown um, that was very restrictive, uh, much, much more so than what we've seen at home. Um, essentially uh, couldn't leave their homes, uh, medical emergencies only, um, really narrowly defined essential work. And that lasted until May 4th. And so um, the, coming into May 4th, the government had a, a six week, three phased reopening plan. And on that first step on May 4th, didn't even bring them to where ever, you all have been at home uh, this entire time. So. Uh, only this past uh, week and a half could the Italians even just leave their homes to go outside to go for a walk uh, or to run or ride a bicycle or any of those sorts of things. And uh, as uh, bases located here, co-located with the Italians, we have complied with those decrees as well, which means uh, I've been confined to base <laughs> for the entire time I've been here so far. That must have been quite remarkable when people were finally able to, to get outside after so many weeks being locked up. What was that like? It really was. Um, I mean, as you know, I'm a runner. And so on uh, our, our larger base, I can do a, a three-mile loop. Uh, and so this week, doing my run uh, and seeing on the other side of the fence, uh, Italian families finally able to be outside and together. Uh, I mean, I'll admit it, it was emotional. Like I just, I, I felt, I felt joy for them. Um, they have really suffered and sacrificed a lot here. Mm -hmm. So what's happened in terms of the number of cases and, and the number of deaths? Have things stabilized or have they noticed any, any difference since the, the reopening began? Yeah, great question. So they've actually been on a, a downward slide, a positive, of movement in uh, overall infections moving downward, recoveries moving upward, and then the other metric we follow closely is um, number of people nationally in the ICU. So for about three weeks now, with a little blip here and there, all of those numbers have been trending uh, in a positive direction. Now what's interesting is with that first phase of reopening on May 4th, the numbers have continued to move in a really positive direction. In fact, last week on Wednesday, the number of recovered overall um, surpassed the number of infected overall. And now just over a week later, the gap between those two is over 30,000 people. So not only are the numbers moving in a positive direction, they're actually uh, accelerating. So really great news here. Mm -hmm. Now, when I go out uh, here in our area, as the, the restrictions have been opened up a, a little bit, I see maybe a third of the people, possibly half of the people wearing masks. Is that a different story over there, a different attitude toward masks and social distancing than we might be experiencing here in the Northland? Yeah, and it is, you know, obviously I'm staying in tune with what's going on at home, and that really is a stark contrast. So as things open up, you know, what I've seen are two things. One is there is this um, I think appreciation for what they went through and uh, a real sense of uh, we don't want to mess this up. Like we sacrificed and suffered a lot. Um, so we're going to play by the rules. And here that means 
wearing a mask. Uh, it's required uh, if you're going to be within six feet of another person. Um, uh, and you have to have one on your person at all times, even if you're not wearing it. Um, and then as businesses reopen within each industry, there are also some COVID guidelines and best practices being put into play. Um, now, the, the, the face mask wearing thing is not new for us in uniform. On April 5th, the Department of Defense mandated it on all DOD installations across the globe. So we've been wearing face masks as a requirement for over a month now. Um, yeah, you know, and at this point, it, it, it's just habit. I always have one in my pocket if I'm going to go into a business, to a post office, to the commissary, our version of a grocery store. It just, you know, it takes 30 seconds and I put it on and you go about your business. And then when you're back out and have more open space, you, you can take it off. All right. Well, I hate to cut you off. It's wonderful to see you, uh, see you safe and to hear your voice. And we really thank you for your service. Uh, so if you could um, stay healthy and uh, hopefully awesome. we'll get a, a chance to talk with you when you get back to town. That would be wonderful. Thanks, Julie. Good to see you and hear your voice. All right. Thank you. You can follow Almanac North on our social media sites, whether you are at home or returning to work. You will find us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And visit the WDSC website for program updates and more information about special COVID-19 programming here at the station. Thanks to our guests and to the crew here at Almanac North. I'm Julie Zenner. Stay healthy, everyone. We'll see you next time.